Welcome back to the Super Resense Podcast, everybody. Super pumped to have you back here on the show. And today we've got a returning guest. Welcome back, Anthony. How are you going? Oh, I'm great. Thank you so much for welcoming me back on the show. I really appreciate that. Super pumped to have you back on the show. So Anthony, for those who don't know, Anthony Metivier uh, was on the show. Uh, episode 153. This was, wait, when was this? This was May 2018, two years ago. Can you imagine? I, I can. Actually, time goes fast, but it was a, a wonderful thing just to run into you on the street and uh, yeah. to, f- to follow up with a recording. Yeah, that's that's really cool. So we're both, uh, for those also who don't know, we're both Udemy instructors. And uh, I took, I actually took uh, one of Anthony's courses. And like, I think I told you what benefited me the most, the course was great, but also uh, I don't think I finished the course, but what benefited me a lot was how you promoted the course and that inspired me and a lot of um you know the way we communicated with students at the time and and then like it happened that you are in uh, calvin grove brisbane australia like out of all places in the world like i have no idea i just saw you in a cafe i was like crazy you're still there right Oh yeah, I haven't budged an inch. I, I, this is the most stable I've ever been. I've moved probably every year or every two years for all of my life. This is the first time I can think of where I've been in the same place for three years straight. And now it's more than three years. Wow. Wow. Insane. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting thing, like staying put in one place. Like I've, I've been moving around quite a bit, but the past several months because of this you know, coronavirus situation, I've been in one one place for yeah for over a month now and it feels it feels interesting like you you don't feel rushed you don't feel like you're living out of a suitcase and and also the life life is very slowed down quite a bit yeah Mm. yeah it's interesting there's just some research that some of the increase in things like dementia and alzheimer's is because people are moving around so much their neural networks aren't building the same sta- stability and robustness over time because they have to constantly relearn geography. Mm-hmm. It's a theory, and I don't know how the science will play out over time, but it is something that people have questioned to see if there's an explanation for this increase since airplane travel and all sorts of new nomadism as people travel around. Wow. And we know from early examples of nomadism like people would their grandparents would die and they would go on their tours and then they would come back to the place where they buried their grandparents and they'd see the stones and they would have forgotten that that was grandpa that they buried and then they would think that it was a god or something like that that built this structure because they couldn't remember and so part of being constantly on the on the move could potentially be part of why people are more forget forgetful it's not just blaming instagram or other things on the internet it can be uh, our our mobility. Wow, you you think that it'd be the other way around? Um, that uh, the more you experience new things, the more neural pathways are created in your brain. Well, potentially, and again, it's just some research that mm. I've read, and I don't know where it's going to go. Mm. But the quality of creating new neural pathways comes from how stable they are, right? Mm-hmm. So if you're constantly forcing your brain to develop new ones, but you're not reinforcing them, that cabling in the, in the wiring, which involves, you know, norepinephrine and myelin and dopamine and all these wonderful opioid receptors, that doesn't necessarily last long if it isn't reinforced. Okay. Wow. Interesting. I I often feel like that, that, um, like I sometimes like I'm becoming forgetful about locations, like you said. So maybe, yeah, there probably is. Truth to that. Um, okay. What else have you been up to apart from staying put? Well, I recently did a TEDx down in Melbourne, and that was really Congrats. touch and go. I actually talked to the people. I was like, are you sure we should be doing this? Because uh. this was early February, or I did it in fe- by February 20th, but early February, I asked them, you know, yeah. are you going to be canceling it? Because yeah. I was cautious. I was a little bit overly concerned maybe, but I went to the doctor and I said, is it moral? Is it ethical for me to get on a plane knowing that I could go to Melbourne and come back and infect, you know, 10 X people around me or whatever. She just said, look, if you're going to get this, get it early. And Mm -hmm. this is a big opportunity to go give a TEDx. So go and do it. So I did. And that's what I've been up to. And 
yeah, just the usual stuff on the Magnetic Mary Method podcast and the YouTube channel, always working to improve what we do and uh, working towards releasing a new book here, which yeah. uh, I hope is going to help even more people. Yeah, speaking of the book, it's really cool, very exciting. So uh, when is it coming out? Well, the launch date is May 20th. <laughs> Sorry. May 20th. The launch date is May 20th. And that is going to be Kindle and print and audio. So we're really excited about that. Yeah. Um, but the, the good news is that it's already available on audio, right? Like even at the time we're recording this podcast. Yeah, that's true. There's been a bit of a mistake because I'm relearning how to launch books on Amazon. Yeah. And I didn't realize that when I put a pre-order up, that yeah. that logical rule didn't govern every medium. So uh -huh. as part of getting prepared, I uploaded all the files for the audiobook, uh -huh. and they put it up. And I said, no, 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 this is supposed to be governed by the pre-launch stuff. And because of the stuff that's going on, like customer service and getting back to me has been incredibly slow. And yeah. so, yeah, it's there, but it's not, there. <laughs> it's not supposed to be there. <laughs> but by all means, if people want to grab it, that's, uh, that's fine, because I haven't heard back from them to get it taken down. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, the the good thing is that uh, I, which I'm very excited about, I got uh, the chance to get a copy uh, on because I couldn't. I also couldn't get the uh, hard copy, like uh, like um, purchase the hard copy. But I was able to purchase the audio audible version and um, listen to it. Uh, listen, I haven't finished the whole book. It's a big book. It's like what eleven eleven hours or something like that. Yeah, it's it's ambitious. You know, I had a couple of models in mind. Yeah. So I thought, what would a Tim Ferriss book be like for yeah. memory? Yeah. If the four-hour body was, you know, the four-hour memory or whatever, yeah. what would that look like? How would he approach this? And then I thought about Moonwalking with Einstein, which is a yeah. very famous book about memory by Joshua Four. And then I thought about things like the Bhagavad Gita or Bhagavad Gita, as you would pronounce it in Sanskrit. And how can we bring these three things together? What would that book look like? And that's Part of why it's a big, ambitious book that's quite detailed and has a lot of ins and outs. Uh huh. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So, the plan for today's podcast for our listeners is what this is what we're going to do. First of all, it's going to be minimal data science or AI and stuff like that. This is mostly about memory and how to improve your focus, memory, productivity, calm, peace of mind, like all these important things that. Uh, translate into fulfillment in your career, right? Like, because on this podcast, we talk a lot about techniques and data science, careers and things like that. Well, sometimes it's good to take a break and talk about uh, more fulfillment things and productivity and other things like that, memory. Um, so the plan for this podcast is, this is how I'd like to structure it. We The book is big and it's it's a, quite a a deep book. So it's it's a complex book and you'll see here why from this podcast. So what why I invited Anthony to the um show is to talk about like some key takeaways, some key things that we can really apply because from your previous appearance I was telling you before the podcast that um you you shared some techniques uh, and I'll I'll sh I'll explain which ones but like at least one technique that I've been using since then for a long time and has been helping me a lot. So the plan for today is let's talk about some techniques and tips that you can give from the book already and then if somebody wants to really dive deeper then the book would be the approach to take to take there yeah absolutely so what what technique did you, are you referring to okay so the technique i'm referring to is um w w memorizing names you taught me this really cool way we were, like i remember we were sitting in your house in in the studio we didn't have the green screen yet um and you taught me this approach to memorize names that when you meet somebody and if they're i don't know like their name is charlotte and you know a charlotte in your life you instantly find some something on their face or something on like about their about their appearance there where that stands out to you and you attach the charlotte that you know from your life to uh to that feature that stands out and that is permanent you know that is not just like you know like the hat they're wearing today because the hat they can take it off the next day when you see them. And then next time you see them, you instantly see that like kind of like augmented reality style. You see the attached Charlotte on them. So like, for instance, if I meet somebody called David, I have a friend, a really dear friend who's David. And right away, like for instance, this person has 
uh, very bright blue eyes or something like that. Then I will take my David from my memory and put him in the eyes like as if he's mining out like gems out of there. So next time I see this person, I'm like, oh, wow, their eyes are so bright blue, something that stands out to me. And then I'm like, oh, okay. So and then I'll see, I'll remember that I put my David mining, uh, you know, gems out of their eyes. And that uh, reminds me that their name is David, like association like that. It's a very powerful technique. So thank you. So over the past two years, I've used a countless number of times. Yeah, it's really powerful. Hey, everybody, hope you're enjoying this amazing episode. This is a quick announcement and we'll get right back to it. We are hiring at Super Data Science. With the recent pandemic and the coronavirus, we all know how a lot of people have lost their jobs and their source of income. So hopefully this will be a breath of fresh air for some people out there. Uh, we are a 100% remote team. We all work online. We're continuing to grow. And I've just literally just published 10 new positions at Super Data Science, which might be suitable to you. And even if they're not suitable to you, check them out. They're at superdatascience.com slash careers. Check them out and send them to somebody you know who may have been displaced by this pandemic and all the lockdowns who may have lost their job and source of income. You could change their life. We are creating opportunities for people to do their best work, to contribute, to create amazing products and create amazing experiences for people studying data science. So here are some of the positions that have just been released. A VP of Marketing, Product Designer, General Manager, VP of Sales, Junior Media Creator, Sales Representative, B2B Event Sales Representative, Event Marketer, B2B Sales Representative, and Marketing Strategist. And those are just some of the initial positions that we have available right now. More will come soon. So keep an eye out at superdatascience.com slash careers. Maybe we'll even post a data scientist position in the near future. But even if none of these are relevant to you specifically, if you know somebody who's in marketing or in sales or who's a great general manager, who's great at creating amazing products in education and learning experiences, or who's great at running events or somebody who is amazing at creating animated videos, if you know any of these people, any people with the right talents and skills, please send them this link, superdescience.com slash careers. This could change their life or career, especially in these difficult times. Thank you very much for your help and let's get right back to it. Yeah. So let's um, let's get to this book. Like, so what prompted you to write this book? Like, uh, it's a very, um, for me, I found... A, a very vulnerable book, right? You share a lot of your story about your uh, depression and how you uh, had a lot of suicidal thoughts back in the time and how you're on the verge of, you know, ending your life and not wanting to continue and how memory training, how memory techniques uh, helped you get out of there. In addition to all these other things, you, you talk about Wim Hof and his method, you talk about the Sistema, the Russian martial arts method, uh, and there's lots of interesting encounters in the path. It's it's a very, uh, like I said, it's almost like a biography, but with you're you're not holding back anything. You're talking about all the dark, dark parts of your story. Why did you choose to do that? Well, again, it was sort of what would this book be like if it was Moonwalking with Einstein meets a Tim Ferriss style mm -hmm. book and meets the Bhagavad Gita. And so, for people who don't know Bhagavad Gita, it is literally a god on the battlefield talking to a soldier who's reluctant to fight the battle. Mm. And one thing that we're often reluctant to do is to confront our own story. And basically what happened at the same cafe you and I randomly met in, at, in Kelvin Grove, a guy named Ben Fischel was telling me about the ability to stop thinking. And I said, no, no way. This can't be possible. <laughs> and I said, I've meditated for years. I finally gave up on this. How is it even possible? Like, you would always be even having thoughts about the absence of thought if you had it. Like, there, yeah. there must be some sort of symbolism in the field. And he said, well, yeah, maybe so. But uh, there is something called persistent symbolic or symb persistent non symbolic experience or PNSE. And I was like, oh, that just sounds insane. I mean, they if they have to symbolize it with an acronym, I mean, it must, <laughs> must already be a false starter. Anyway, we got into this whole thing about religion and stuff. And I said, no, there's no way I'm ever going to memorize scripture to help slow down my thoughts. And I'm not going to, you know, kowtow or 
bow or do yoga movements or any of this. And I was just rejecting it. And quite strongly, like with the atheist ban him. And he says, all of a sudden, you've got to read Gary Weber. And I was like, oh, and I was just ready to shoot him down. Like Gary Weber, another guy who's got some, you know, acronym or whatever. And he says, because he was an atheist too. And he required a scientific method to stop his thoughts. And then one day they just blew out like a candle. And he says, they never came back. And I'm still like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And he said, yeah, but here's the thing. He just memorized some Sanskrit. And right. that's how it happened, right? And it turns out that that's actually not the way that it went, but that's how I sort of recorded it into my memory. So, but the thing is, is Gary Weber teaches in these books, happiness beyond thought, evolving beyond thought, and dancing beyond thought. But if you memorize some Sanskrit, you're basically taking in some algorithms that will neutralize your existing mental thoughts. And it works actually. And it makes total sense because it turns out this Sanskrit is all based on logical laws that we've come to know very well from other traditions. And if you have certain negative thoughts in your mind, which I have had for years crushing me all the time, you can just revert to this Sanskrit. And long story short, after memorizing over a hundred verses of Sanskrit, because I'm you know in for a penny, in for a pound. Once I'm sold, I'm going to do it, right? Uh, so I memorized all this Sanskrit, and one day I was having a sea change on the internet. You know, Google wasn't doing things the way that I liked it, etc. And I was about to throw the computer across the room, and I just stopped myself. I went out for a walk. I went to a park in uh, Kelvin Grove here in Brisbane, and I sat and I said my little Sanskrit that I memorized, and then all of a sudden all my thoughts disappeared. And I just was blown away. It was sheer bliss. And now I can kind of do it on demand. Like it doesn't always work every time, but just by running through the Sanskrit, I can usually go into this total silent bliss. And I really would call it the absence of thought. It's extraordinarily wonderful to experience. Very interesting. Uh, I love it. Like that's what a lot of uh, people are trying to get through meditation. First of all, what is Sanskrit? Uh, and uh, it sounds like, and how is this not a religious thing? Like, sounds like a very like a like a like a spell. Like you're saying a spell, and you know, I'm always like a bit cautious of those things. I don't want I don't want to uh, get into <laughs> like voodoo stuff. So, how is this not voodoo stuff? Well, I didn't want to get into it either, and you know, I still have skepticism about the whole thing. But I'm glad that I I put that aside because it's not religion. It actually comes from a tradition called Advaita Vedanta, which means in Sanskrit, which is a language that's thousands of years old, it means not to. At the end of the Vedas, the Upanishadic texts, the culmination of that knowledge is not to, Mm -hmm. just one. So Advaita Vedanta, Advaita means not to, and Vedanta means uh, the end of the Vedas, the, uh-huh. the, the conclusion of the great Vedantic or Veda texts, Vedic texts is that it's not two, it's just one. <laughs> now, if you run the calculations and you know, this is not just isolated to ancient Indian philosophy. It appears again in Giordano Bruno, who, for whom we owe astronomy and it, the ideas of infinity that caught on so well. Uh, to this day, you know, and you can watch Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about how important Bruno was. Bruno discovered mathematically that it is oneness and all separation and all variety, et cetera, is in a field of the same, right? And so on and so on. So we, we know that this, is, this non-duality is, is perfectly logical. And it's not only that, but if you really do contemporary philosophy, you'll ultimately come to something called hard solipsism, which is versus soft solipsism. And it's, it's the brain in the vat theory eventually, right? And how do you confirm that there is actually anything out in the world? Well, you don't get to, right? But yeah. what you can confirm is one screen right in front of you. The question is, how can you realize that screen right in front of you so thoroughly and completely that you experience what Eckhart Tolle calls the power of now, uh-huh. and you actually just live in the now, right? By, by screen, you mean like what we see, right? Like the, the world around us. Yeah. So for example, now this is a bit of a thought puzzle, but the idea that you see through your eyes, right? 
Yeah. Yes, you do. Like there, I'm not contesting that. I'm not saying that that's not true. But what I'm saying is the very idea that you see through your eyes is appearing inside of you, uh-huh. right? And what is it that is you? Well, it's just this screen. And when you move your head left and you move your head right, this screen just moves. Uh-huh. And you have this sense that there's a body, you know, a brain behind you. But the very idea that there's a back of your head yeah. is still appearing in you. Yeah as is everything else in the world appearing in you. So there is only really one thing, and that is whatever you are paying attention to in the moment. Uh, Memory scientists call it selective attention, right? Mm -hmm. So the power of now, Eckhart Tolle, like I love Eckhart Tolle. I always read this guy because he is pretty much secular. That's a great book. I love the power of now. Very difficult as well. Uh, And, you know, like for me, and some chapters, I love how it's structured in chapters. Like I, I clearly remember... For me, chapter eight was on relationships, and that that was like a huge impact. That's why I remember the number. And uh, and it's a book that I think it was three years ago I read. It's a time to come back and reread again. Very very deep thoughts there. Yeah, and it's worth it. But he doesn't, it, to my satisfaction or to my understanding, he doesn't really have a program. He doesn't say, you know, what do you do to realize the now, right? Mm. Gary Weber is different. Gary Weber looks at brain science. And he says, well, look, if you think about it, the whole notion of difference and the idea that you have an I actually, if we look at the brain scans, appears to be produced by what's called the default mode network. And it's up in the front of your forehead. But there's another part of the brain called the task positive network. And that area of the brain is what Mihayu Csikszentmihalyi called uh, 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 flow, right? Uh And we sometimes think of it as being in the zone. So one of the propositions of running all this Sanskrit through your head is, could it help knock you into flow and keep you there? And it's just a biological function. And part of that transformation for a lot of people seems to have been some memorization. So Eckhart Tolle, he will quote things that he's memorized. And I've observed this about him. And I just think, I wonder if that deep, absorption of some semantic text and its meanings and its sounds somehow helps keep you in that task positive network in flow or in the zone. And then I look at, you know, recommendations from Gary Weber to memorize all this Sanskrit, which has semantic meaning. None of it is religious. It's actually purely atheist. The the only thing that you can conclude from it is that there's just one thing going on. There can't be a God because God would be me plus God, right? Mm. But that doesn't make sense because mm. where does God appear? God appears in me, mm. right? In my screen. Mm. So it all sort of, I, I, I may be throwing too many ideas around here, but if you're living in the zone, which we know is neurochemically possible and this, the brain just has this sort of feature, then what is there except for you climbing up a mountain totally in the zone, right? You're just there. You're present. What else is that except for one thing? Okay. For all extents and purposes. Very good. And that brings us really nicely to one of the main themes of your book. You talk about uh, meditation in combination with memory training, that they come hand in hand, that by meditating, you can improve your memory. By improving your memory, you can enhance your meditation abilities. Um, tell us a bit more about that. Well, I think it is very, very important. We know from research that just four times a week of meditation will already improve your memory. Hmm. Four times like an hour, five hours, how long? There are different studies and some people recommend 15 minutes. Some people do recommend a 45 minute session. I think the consistency is more important than the actual length. Uh And, you know, Tim Ferriss, when he talks about meditation, he has a really great set of tips, which is if you think you can memorize for 10 minutes, set your clock for eight minutes. So rather than, you know, you mean meditate if you can meditate, meditate, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, If you think you can meditate for uh, 10 minutes, then, you know, set your clock for eight. And that's a really, really good tip because I often, you know, we, we often have planning fallacy. We think we can do things for longer than we can. And then I would just add to that, that when your alarm goes off, just sit for a little bit longer to train yourself progressively to sit for a bit longer. But I wouldn't suggest people get caught up in the numbers game. Like, oh, I meditated for 45 minutes and you only meditated for 10. It's the consistency and the 
frequency that really matters over time so that you can begin to experience a shift in your conscious perception. Okay. As how does that link to memory? Well, my, my strong recommendation based on my experience and my observation of other people who have experienced this change from, you know, suffering from thought to being released from thought and even having what is described as no thought, which I rejected at first, but now really uh, stand beside because I felt it. I, I think that we have all the evidence in the world that some meditation linked with memorization is what will help train you to be in the zone particularly if the material you memorize is designed to neutralize the presence of thought. And that's what's really genius about what Gary Weber put together, what he has extracted from some of these ancient texts, because he doesn't just throw you know, massive textbooks to memorize. He has cultivated particular what are called self-inquiry questions that help neutralize thought. So when you meditate and you start to learn what your consciousness is, and you meditate on questions that cause you to reflect upon in a way that dissolves the nature of thought, then you begin to break it apart and it will, quote unquote, dissolve or be neutralized. Okay. And so in that state, <laughs> so when you have no thought, you're able to, is that, is that like making space in your mind to memorize more things? Or is it about that? you when you do memorize you're more focused on what you're memorizing that's an interesting question i don't think we need to make more space in our minds i mean hmm. one of the infinity uh, puzzles is the the hotel where well how would you if if every room was occupied how would you make room for one more person well you would just have each person move one one room over and now yeah. the first room is empty and then if you actually get them to move just to all the even numbered rooms or whatever then you've just doubled infinity right yeah, so yeah. i don't think there's a problem with space or you know room for memory or whatever um david eagleman who's a neuroscientist says that we have a zettabyte in our brain right? oh wow like we're, we're, we're not going to run out of space memory space uh anytime soon but what we're what we're doing by having no thought is we're reducing suffering the suffering that thought creates, not only because we're worried about something that happened in the past that's never going to change, but we're worrying about something in the future that, you know, is potentially not ever going to happen, right? And we're torturing ourselves with it, or we're having fantasies about an alternative presence. And th th that present is not here. It can't be here because this is the present that we're in. So that's not only psychological pain, but it's also just robbing your attention from the things that you have to do right now to be a better father, to be a better programmer, to be a better data scientist, to be a better human being, because you are present in the now and you're not being distracted by endless reams of thought. And then you just have more energy and you have more joy because it's just, you know, lights on, nobody home. Let's enjoy this present moment. And it's just, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Understood. Um, all right. So, uh, in your book, you you mention uh, oh actually before the podcast you mentioned that uh, <laughs> it was funny how you said uh, memorizing no me why is memorizing healthy right why is memorizing good and you said you have a um, a person who's memorized loads of pi as in like the the number pi and I think you said twelve twelve hundred digits of the number pi one of your students memorized and you also mentioned that memorizing stuff. Um, can help improve productivity. Like how, how are those two linked? Well, I don't know just exactly how productive it is to memorize 1200 digits of pi, but Marno <laughs> Herman is his name. He's just a very young guy. He has a, I think it's still, he still has it, uh, a, a South African memory record for 1200 digits. He recites it very quickly uh, in about 10 minutes. It sounds just wonderful to hear him blast it out. And, you know, you can imagine the productivity just from there, being able to focus that intensely on yeah. a performative act that's generating from memory with 100% accuracy, that's going to have, that's a transferable skill to focusing on anything. There's a, a fellow named Paul Deary, who's another student of mine. He's done a hundred digits and he's a teacher. There's a video of him on 
YouTube, you can watch him reciting this in front of all his fellow teachers. And, you know, they're cheering him on. And I, I know from having talked with him that he's just much better teacher because he remembers the stuff. He doesn't have to go into his textbooks all the time. You know, he's more present with the students and he's more direct and knowledgeable with them because he's internalized it, you know, not humming and hawing and looking in textbooks. Robert Adut, who has yay math, he is in my training in the Magnetic Memory Method Masterclass. He used this. He, was, he gave us an example of memorizing nine very complex formulas. And he just teaches now from memory instead of telling the students, well, I'll have to look up exactly how that you know, equation is structured. He's just boom, on the board, ready to go. So it, that saves so much time. It also impresses other people. I've got people uh, on my podcast who have been through my course, like Jesse Villalobos. He got a raise, he got a promotion, you know, and he had to because all the other workers are coming to him asking for his advice about, you know, parts in the auto body shop and stuff like that. So, you know, he just accelerates the manager because he obviously has it all in his head. He's managing a massive amount of material. So, yeah, it makes you productive, much more productive, and you stand out as an individual. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Um, can you share some techniques now that we know why it's important, why it's powerful? Uh, can you share some techniques, like uh, maybe some insights from your book on how to do this? Like, uh, probably we're not going to um, do a lot of Sanskrit here, but actually, it'll be fun if you can uh, read out, if you don't mind, some of the Sanskrit that you memorize, just to hear how it sounds, like like maybe a few seconds of it. Very, 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 very gladly. So. The, the, what I'm going to say here, the way that Gary Weber translates it into English is he does it in two ways. He does the actual sort of literal translation, and then he does a sort of compression of how to use it in more modern terms. But the, 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 I'll just give you the most powerful stuff. And if you just memorize this in English, I'm confident that it's going to help you. And it's so obvious why it will help you too once you hear it. But in Sanskrit, Chittameva Mahadosham, Chittameva Hi Balakaha, Chittameva Mahatmayam, Chittameva Mahanasat, right? That's just very simple. Now, what it's saying there is that your mind is, is the greatest folly in the, in the world. Your mind is like an undisciplined little boy running all over the place, right? And then it just sort of repeats that sort of idea that, that the mind is a great illusion. And to, 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 to be seduced into thinking that your mind is real is just... It's just complete misery and suffering, uh -huh. right? Now, the more modern version, which I thought was the translation the first time I memorized it, I made a bit of a mistake, but a very fruitful one is just simply, are my thoughts useful? How do they behave? Uh -huh. And so as I was memorizing this, and we'll talk about exactly how I memorized that, I'm really focused on this Sanskrit and I'm walking around in my daily life or I'm sitting and meditating and I'm just thinking, are my thoughts useful? How do they behave? No, they're not. Yeah. And they're behaving like an undisciplined little child. And then they start to go away, right? Because you've just labeled them. But I think something about that Sanskrit gives you even more critical distance, right? It gives you more focus and it gives you more tools for replacing it because it's musical. And when you have you know, 32 or 100 of them, I progressively added this, more and more questions like, do my thoughts have value? Or, you know, how does the idea that I am my body come into being, right? All these wonderful things by focusing on them in two languages at the same time, and then hearing the sounds and thinking about them logically as Sanskrit gives you a little bit more uh, of a feeling of that logic, it just starts to dissolve your thoughts, right? It, 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 it's almost impossible for it not to. And it neutralizes, I think dissolve is maybe not the right word. It's more like it neutralizes them, just sucks them of life. Um, so how do you memorize it, right? Well, you do it the same way I memorized my TEDx presentation. You do it the same way I memorized everything that I've learned in German or any language, really. You have a memory palace. And a memory palace is a mental reproduction of a room. So the last time I was on your podcast, you gave me some names. And I don't remember them all now because I haven't you know, done this process of getting them into long-term memory. Uh, but I remember the one uh, that came up that was interesting. People might want to go listen to that episode was Mary. And there's, that was one of those names. And I just placed that in a corner of the room, the same room we were sitting in. Yeah. 
and I, I make an, an image. So it was something like Chittameva Mahadosham. Literally, there's a guy in a Hardy Boys novel that I read as a kid named Chet. Uh -huh. And then a tambourine is an uh -huh. instrument, Chit Tham, uh -huh. right? And then Maha, that's a little bit hard, but the Chinese symbol for Ma can fit there quite nicely. Uh -huh. And it's laughing, ha ha, Chitameva yeah. Maha. And then Do Sham, well, Homer Simpson from the, from the Simpsons goes, Do, right? Yeah. Gammy is a kind of cloth that you use to clean cars. So yeah. Chitameva Maha Do Sham, right? And then the whole idea of, are my thoughts useful? How do they behave? Well, you can think Homer Simpson going, do, is that a useful thought? Yeah. Right? So this is sort of conceptual. And to weave it into memory even more completely, I run a little software that I call Cave Cogs. Yeah. And that's an acronym. It starts with a K for kinesthetic, auditory, visual, emotional, conceptual, olfactory, gustatory, and space. Yeah. So... In the beginning, that can seem like a lot, yeah. but if you learn how to do it, you train yourself how to do it, it's no more difficult than brushing your teeth or tying your shoes. And so it's like, well, Chet from the Hardy Boys, what does it feel like to be him listening in his ears to Homer Simpson getting frustrated over the chamois there, right? Yeah. And that also encompasses the sound and the visuals of it, you know, is like, you can just imagine what these characters look like and the emotions, frustration, et cetera, the little you know, the thoughts undisciplined or whatever, you can start to build this little story. And then you think about, well, the concept, well, Homer Simpson is a concept. So is Hardy boys, etc. The, the idea of a tambourine is the concept of music. And you go through to the taste, you know, of what is it? Duff beer or something like, and the, and the smells. If you just go through that, you will remember stuff so fast. It'll make your head spin. And it, in a good way, of course, it's, it's really fun. And then you just go back to that corner in the memory palace later and you say what was happening there and then you just start to piece it back together it's like a puzzle and just by doing that that's called active recall we know from the neuroscience of learning and you can listen to neuroscientists like boris conrad talk about this you will not really remember anything whether you're using memory techniques or not if you don't practice active active recall you have to nudge yourself to recall things to learn it and so we just go back and we ask ourselves what happened there and if you do this right, maybe five or six repetitions, you'll have it for a very long time. Maybe not forever, but a significant period of time. Okay, gotcha. So it's like invoking different parts of your brain, not just your, uh, like, I don't know, maybe visual memory or auditory memory. You're going through everything from taste to smell to kinesthetic, uh, emotional, try like seeing how it feels and things like that to uh, better like increase the chances of you memorizing. Yeah. Yeah. And so the book goes through that in quite significant detail and ex you know, I don't bog people down too much in the, in the science, but rest assured there, this has been studied to the nth degree and memory champions have been put under all kinds of wonderful, you know, tests. And we just know a lot about it. The real question is how do we encourage people to do it? And there's a scientist named Tim Doglish who's doing amazing work showing how that these techniques are helping help people heal depression, to feel better from, you know, having certain psychological issues because they've got P PTSD or whatever. And it's very compelling, the results that he's getting just from using memory palaces. In his research, he calls it method of loci, which is an older term for memory palace. And he just has people using these tools to memorize certain things. And lo and behold, they report higher levels of happiness and less mental suffering. Mm. And it just makes okay. sense. It stands to reason that you would. Let's talk about me a bit about men memory palaces. How specifically I would like for somebody listening to this to get a takeaway on how they can build their own memory palace. So I have a memory palace, which I built when I was, I think around like 14 years old. This was even before I went to university. I think it was like grade 10 or something like that. Um, and because I did some like training on how to memorize things better and how to read fast. It was like a speed reading training. And it, it was very interesting. I learned a lot and I did at the time, did learn to read faster. Um, and one of the things was a memory palace. And I built that in the room where I was living uh, with my parents back at the time. and. I still use it to this day. Like when I need to remember 
things like was, let's say we're out with my girlfriend we're talking about something or in the car and then uh i don't have like a place to write it down i can't put it in my phone and in, in the moment and it's like it's not it's not a big thing to be uh, like taking my phone out every time and writing down i just put it into this memory palace uh, like it has 10, 10 spots. That's all I have. You know, you probably have like hundreds of memory palaces with like thousands of uh, locations in each one. I just have one room with 10 spots. And so I might remember, okay, I need to take, pick up, like, or let's say I need to, when we go grocery shopping, I need to buy rice and then this, like I know, water, toilet paper, and whatever else. And so I put them in these specific locations. And that way, uh, like also there's a bit of a, um, um, associative memory working like because each location has some unique feature like it might be opening a cupboard and putting the toilet paper roll in there so when I need to recall it I walk into the room and I go from left to right through these 10, 10 spots and then by the time I get a cupboard I open it, I'm like oh yeah there's a big massive toilet paper roll in there or I go to the balcony or not balcony like window sill you know like the the part of the window inside the house and i see like lots of water standing there meaning that okay i gotta buy water things like that so um it's a very basic trivial memory palace but it's it helped me a lot you know to not forget uh, trivial things so for somebody who's never built a memory palace i think this is a very useful technique even having a tiny little memory palace just for for daily things like that um how would you describe this process and how would you help uh, like what, what kind of steps can a person take to build a memory palace already today you know maybe they're listening to this in their room and they can look around or maybe if they're on a jog then they, when they, they can think of their room what it looks like or, or some some location they know what steps can they take already today to build this memory palace yeah that's a great question and the way that i teach it and i teach it this way for a reason is to reduce cognitive overload immediately by drawing the plan so get out a piece of paper and draw a square, just as simple as that. And then think, where is the spot that is the dead end? So if you have just a room and the door is located in a particular place, where is the corner you would run into a dead end? And then reverse the journey and start in the dead end. So you're leading yourself out mm -hmm. and you can extrapolate that principle to an entire apartment or an entire house. Where would you, if you were to start at your door and move inside, which is the way the memory palace is normally taught, yeah. where would be the dead end? And then start at the first station of this memory palace at that dead end and then move outward. I think that that's the number one tip that I would give. It helps so many people to, because you're externalizing it. You're doing some strategy, some planning, and you're removing errors later. Because if you try to build it as you go, which you can, and sometimes I do, but I, I always regret it because it's just so simple to sit there and just draw it out first, sit, settle on it to the best of your ability. You sometimes will change it later as you go, but have a plan, have a strategy. We all know this, right? That, that's yeah. how life is, the game of life is one, plan and strategy, but also visualize it so that you can see it outside of your mind and have it better memorized as a result because you're using something that's called the levels of processing effect which is involves drawing and writing some words you know you might say station one is the southeast corner and then plan out that journey so if you want 10 stations to memorize 10 things or 10 lines of sanskrit or 10 phrases in spanish or whatever it is then you're going to want to predict how much space you might need for that and then as soon as you can start using it and this is going to be very, very valuable for when you use it for getting it into long-term memory. Because the next big tip that I have for people, and this is something that isn't taught, I don't know why it isn't taught, but it's very, very important, which is that the memory palace is not just for storing stuff forever. It's for getting it into long-term memory. In order to do that, what you want to do is use it in a particular way. So you want to follow the journey forward and backward after you've memorized some stuff. Then you want to start in the middle and go from the beginning and then go back to the middle and go to the end. And then you want to skip your stations. And the reason why you want to do that, go from station one to three to five, to seven to nine, and then backwards over the even numbers is because then you're giving primacy and recency effect to each and every station and the information that is laid there. And you're using serial positioning in order to do that. Now, 
I know that that can sound a lot like a lot in the beginning, but that is how you get it into long-term memory the fastest by reducing the amount of repetitions you have to do. And when you have cave cogs all along the way, you're going to find, oh my goodness, I remember all this stuff. And it's miraculous. It, it, it's the closest thing to real magic that exists. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Let, let's, let's take a few steps back for a second. So I've, uh, let's say I've come up with a room. It, does it have to be a, a location that the person knows very well? Or can it be like a random location? Like, I don't know, the world map. Could you use the world map as a memory palace? You could use the world map, but you would have to have sufficient ability to recall the world map. Okay. So you need something that's already in your memory, like your room, which you see every day is, is a good, is a good starting point. Yeah. So for example, you know, how many people actually know the correct number of states in the United States and could they actually mentally organize all those states? No Some way. people probably could, right? But yeah. if you want to use United States, why couldn't you just use the cardinal points? So you could have, you know, the state of California for the West, you could have New York for the East, you could have, I don't know, whatever's up uh, Michigan or something on the North, and then Texas for the South. And then you've got four uh, stations in your mental map of the United States. And I know some people will say, well, I'm not going to memorize a whole lot of stuff with four, but we know the power of numbers. Four is more than zero. And so you've got this handy little United States map with four little things that you can memorize anytime. Let's start there. I think I think that's a very good example. Let's start there. So then people can take that as a uh, like as a blueprint and then apply it to m maybe more stations in their home. So we've got California on the left, Texas on the bottom. Um, what is it? Uh, New York on the right, on the east coast. And we've got, um, I don't know, which one do you say? Michigan. Is Michigan up at the top? Yeah, I think Detroit is in Michigan and that... Yeah you can see Canada across okay, the river. So great, I'm pretty great. sure that's north. <laughs> okay, so let's say... So uh, there's a city in Canada that is actually south of the United States. Oh, uh, wow. Across from Detroit. And it's, um, it's interesting how that works. I'm not sure if that's true, but I've read that. Okay, gotcha. So Michigan with Detroit, right? So, um, and l let's just put, put it into perspective how it works. This is how I would use it. I would say, okay, uh, California is hot. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's beaches in California. That's, that would be like the characteristic that stands out of that location of my memory palace. Um, um, te uh, Texas is also hot, but it's more like desert. It's, it's like, uh, of course, Texas, I, I have never been, but I'm sure it's beautiful. But first thing that I think of is like cactus, desert, it's like lots of, uh, you know, that type of heat, different type of heat, not beach hot, but like desert hot. Uh, New York, very, you know, finance, lots of people walking around, very populated financial center. And uh, Detroit, more like industrial, car manufacturing, robots, Robocop. Those are the things I think. And so let's say I need to memorize a, a shopping list of four, right? Like on toilet paper, water, um, I need to like, and, and they come in this specific order. So like, I need to buy some toilet paper, I need to buy some water, I need to buy some rice. And let's say I need to buy, uh, I will, like, I don't even know, a computer screen, right? A computer screen. So I would go and I would put them like, cause my memory palace is already structured in that order. So it starts in California and then goes counterclockwise. Like just how it, that's how I structured it. Right. So I, you don't jumble around the memory palace. So I would go, okay, toilet paper, California. How would I link buying, how would you link buying, how, putting toilet paper into that uh, part of the memory palace, into California? So we got toilet paper, we got water, we got rice, we got a computer screen. I think yeah. that's what you said, Yeah. right? So if I had to have the toilet paper in California, the thing I'm thinking of is Val Kilmer. There was a movie called Top Secret. It had this song, Skeet Surfing. And then yeah. I would have him like, you know, using toilet paper while he was, instead of shooting the skeet while he's surfing, he would shoot toilet paper. And uh -huh. then Robocop in Detroit, you know, it's kind of unusual, but he would be pouring water over his head. And then rice, I don't know, Condoleezza Rice, she's uh, at the UN or something, uh, you know, something like that. That's more rice-like, like a person named Rice. And then computer screen, the Wild West, I don't know, maybe John Wayne is shooting the computer screen in Texas. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that would be an interesting way to do it. So, so you you use effectively like those st features that stand out. In this case, on the world map, you have these four locations. You use the features that stand out and link them to create a story with the item that you need to purchase. And 
That's is that the same thing you would do in in your home in the memory palace that you build in your room? Yes, although it's not necessary to have a link between the location and the information. Some people want that certainty, and it can help. But you can, if you want to do that, then here's a, here's a way to do this that is a bit more efficient. It just takes more setup. You would have what's called a zero zero to ninety nine PAO. And that means an image for every number from 00 to 99. So on station 01, you would have an image. And so instead of, you know, I was thinking in Texas of John Wayne and shooting, I would have my image for 01 in that corner. But I could also just as easily make it the Texas corner, right? It's, it's sort of what you want to do and how you want to do it. But personally, I just use the corner because why? make an extra step when I know that that's that corner and I can just focus on what's happening there. But you know, the, the way I teach this is, this is a method for building systems. So if you want to build your systems and you want hooks or features in every place, then by all means build them, but don't create it, don't make it a burden. So what we're talking about with the map there is we, we, we are using natural features of the locations, but there's no real natural feature of a corner. Hmm. So the, it's just that it happens to be my office. So I use that corner and I, I don't need to lend anything. But I love this map idea because you're right. There are these natural things. And if you just simplify it and you allow those natural things to come out, like Detroit and Robocop, which is you know a beautiful thing, provided you know that, but you also might think of Kiss and Detroit Rock City, I think it's called, uh, that song. You, you, know, you might think of other things. So it doesn't have to be Robocop. And if you don't know anything for Detroit, Choose another city, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but I don't think that those steps are necessary. They're certainly not necessary in my own practice. Okay. So how do you, so how do, you do it again without the, without the standing out features? Well, for example, that Chittameva Mahadosham uh, from the Sanskrit, yeah. I, I use what I call the pillar technique. Yeah. So I'm just starting at the top corner of yeah. dealing. Yeah. And then I'm writing down almost like, the ancient Chinese is written from top to bottom uh. and I don't need anything there to trigger it off because I, first of all, know that what I know what I'm memorizing. I chose yeah. this memory palace and strategized it for that purpose. Yeah. And for one piece, it was 32 verses. It's a very big memory palace. It's quite long. It's actually all of Kelvin Grove and the victorious mind has a map of Kelvin Grove that was designed and it looks really quite fun. Yeah. Uh, and I show all of this. I take you through the whole journey. That's really cool. I've seen that map where you created a like a map of uh, the the suburb you're in, and and so it's like a, a map. That's really cool. Yeah, you walk through that map. That's really awesome. It's even got like a little thing hidden in there for people who like Where's Waldo, because <laughs> <laughs> myself and the photographer are hidden in there. Oh, I gave away the secret. Sorry, but uh -huh. yeah, I just place it there. I don't need it to connect because I know what I'm doing. And that's what I encourage students to do, plan and prepare. So you don't have to add these extra gimmicks. You just, oh, in that corner is Chet from the Hardy Boys. And that is, and he has a tambourine or whatever's going on there. Chetam. Like, it's just, why would I need to add Robocop? I mean, it's yeah. just, it's, it's, a, it's a deviation from what this technique can be, okay. uh, I think. But I also say, hey, look, do what it, do what it takes to get done what you want to do. Just plan and prepare to do it. Yeah. Fantastic. But, um, I love it. Memory competitors, I don't know. I, I haven't talked to every mem memory competitor under the sun, but I don't think that they have their memory palaces have any special links. There's no time. You know? yeah, yeah. When, I, when I competed myself, there's no time. Yeah. You just have to be able to lay information down in space and you've got to do it fast. And, that, and that's like, uh, I think it's a more advanced level what you're talking about. It's uh, you're creating the... Uh, the story of that pillar technique. And once you remember chat, the whole thing triggers, right? Chat, tambourine, I don't know, I forgot, <laughs> I already forgot, Homer Simpson, something, 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 right? So like it, it, they flow on from each other. So you can remember as like 10 items or maybe more items, like you, you told me a story where people were memorizing like 50, a deck of 52 cards, a random order of that deck by creating a story of 52 items that flows on from, from one another. Oh yeah. Oh, it's incredible what you can do. You're right. You know, I have a weakness as a teacher of these techniques, which is I just assume that everybody has the same brain mm -hmm. and that they're just going to be able to do this. So I just start from possibility. 
but there, there probably is a lighter way to start. And, you know, I've always framed the magnetic memory method as sort of, you know, more intermediate advanced sort of stuff, because that's what I needed when I yeah. created this training. I read Harry Lorraine. Harry Lorraine was a mentor of mine, actually, and it was very powerful. But his, he's got like three pages on memorizing vocabulary. It's just not sufficient. So I had to go and find this deeper stuff. And I just assumed that I wanted to serve people who also want the heavy lifting tasks. They want 1,200 digits of pi. They want you know, long equations that they memorize. So I just teach directly to that. But there, there are more appropriate trainings for beginner level, for sure. And mm -hmm. everybody, uh, my whole premise of what I do is this is the memory university. I'm never going to restrict information about what I know out there unless they're a complete, you know, corrupt memory teacher. You just <laughs> yeah. got to find your, and this, some of them are like some of them, they actually make their money, not on their memory training, but on selling supplements on the back end, right? Mm -hmm. Which is quite frankly, just unacceptable to me because there's not really good enough research that those supplements actually help your memory. So, you know, anyway, the point being is there's a lot of really great teachers out there and yeah, you should find who's right for you. And I always do my best to promote all the best people out there. And I've had many, many of them on my podcast. Yeah. I was going to ask about your podcast. Um, how, how's that going? How long have you been doing your podcast for? It's funny, a friend of mine, he, he was, he looked me up on, you know, uh, one of these things that the, you have there for looking up podcasts. He's like, how did I not know that you've been podcasting almost every week since 2014? Oh, wow. And I said, I don't know. I mean, you're my friend. I just thought you knew. <laughs> <laughs> Six thought, years. Don't, don't you follow me on Twitter? You know, that sort of thing. <laughs> but yeah, since 2014. Oh, wow. Really cool. And so what, what's the main purpose of the podcast? The main purpose is the vision of Magnetic Mary Method is to inspire encourage and educate people about what's possible with memory techniques mm -hmm. and to assume that every single individual is capable of doing the maximum highest level of performance provided they want it. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about. So it's not about being the best training or, you know, some kind of bizarre, uh, crazy claims about anything. It's about promoting these techniques and also helping people understand that this is thousands of years old yeah. and humanity survived because of these techniques and we're going to survive again because of what people have committed to their memory because doctors don't have time to look up stuff on the internet you know and we see that expertise is really really important right now and people need to be able to get real information from their head quickly and so yeah memory to me memory is survival and memory is flourishing and it's very very important Gotcha. How, how could memory techniques, apart from what we talked about, productivity, meditation, um, uh, no, no thought, how could memory techniques uh, and mastering a memory help somebody in data science, somebody who's you know, very technical, um, like lots of, um, we, we not, not as much formulas, but more like you need to remember different um, algorithms, when to use which one, uh, maybe different use cases from around the world. Uh, research papers also sometimes like I, I like reading research papers. So how can mm, memory techniques help a data scientist? Well, many ways. So one thing, for example, is with understanding. So when you come across a concept you don't understand, a lot of people say don't memorize something until that you've understood it. Yeah. I say it's the opposite. Yeah. Memorize it so that you might understand it because you're building a foundational framework for making connections in your mind, mm. right? So if you come across the name of a paper, you know, it's not that big of a deal, but just knowing that Tim Dalglish, uh, Tim Dalglish wrote this research on method of loci and that he uses method of loci helps me understand what he's doing because I've absorbed it. So I don't know what some specific examples would be, but if you, if you need to memorize some stuff from research about data science, knowing the words that they use, knowing who did it, knowing the date that it was published is going to extend the foundations of your knowledge that gives you more connections so that you might know more. And there's a principle, the more you know, the more you can know. And that's because your brain has more connections. So that's one thing. The next thing would be is if you, I don't know when you say, you know, deciding which algorithm to use when, if that involves decision trees, 
but you can memorize decision trees, for example. And then you have a mental image and framework that you've internalized to refer to, which creates knowledge, which leads to wisdom, right? Which leads to expertise. It leads to a little bit of that secret sauce where you just really know this stuff, right? Yeah. And that doesn't mean you're going to get it right every time. It doesn't mean that you're not going to go and reference things from time to time, but you're going to have internalized decision trees at a much deeper and better level than the other person. And you're going to stand out in that way. And the other thing would be just exercise with memory, which, you know, Nelson Dulles wrote a very kind thing about the victorious mind. He's a multi USA memory champion. He said, he's always thought that memory training was like meditation. So, and I think he's right. You know, you're focusing on information. You're becoming one with it as you use these tools, as you're weaving space and different multi-sensory aspects around. And then you're going to have more focus as a result. And so that focus can help you perform better, make better decisions while you're performing because you're able to get rid of distractions and just be in the moment and get more done with greater consistency and greater quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Um that's that's a real uh, challenge like for me personally focus uh i i don't do social media almost at all except for linkedin um but even so i i can be working on one task and then i can be like oh let's go check this or let's go check my email or let's go do this i even bought i have like here in my uh, bed um deep work by carl newport uh i heard it's a really book good book and i've I think I've read the uh, summary of it on Blinkist, but you know, to help me focus more. So I absolutely agree with you that helping people focus um, would be a great benefit of uh, doing these memory techniques, memory exercises. Yeah, it, it's really important for me because you know, one of my interests in getting rid of thought, even though I was hostile to it in the beginning, is that I was just overrun by thoughts. Even though I am a quite... I was already quite accomplished in what I do, and I already had a PhD and all that sort of stuff. I was still overrun by thoughts all the time, tortured by thoughts all the time, and it's hard to focus. And so, you know, just being free of that noise and being having information, whether it's some crazy old Sanskrit or it's you know just just thinking through. You know, I, I mentioned what is his name, David Hilbert, his hotel there with the infinity sort of. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I energy. love that. I love that. Infinity. It's very meditative just to think that through and yeah. imagine infinity, you know, doubling when you get people to move not just one room over, but two rooms over. Yeah. Like that is a kind of meditation and it's yeah. very, it's very rewarding. And to be able to focus on it, it's because I, is that his name, David Hilbert? I, I haven't quite tested sure. uh, my memory, but in any case, I, I, I tried to commit it to memory and hopefully that's correct. Um, but having just tried to memorize it and then thought through the puzzle. It is so wonderful and rewarding and it creates more focus because it's better content than, oh my God, I, I, I have so many problems and you know this happened in my business and oh, I've got shoulder pain because I do because I have shoulder bursitis now and oh, I got a skin condition, which I do. Like my mind can just go blah, 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 blah. But because I have things memorized, it's just a better quality of thought. So it's not just about having no thought. It's also about just having wonderful things to think about and you can think about them deeply because they're in your mind. Yeah. I like it. in your book, you describe that uh, magnetic memory method that magnets not only attract what they want, but also repel what they don't want. I never thought of it that way. I always thought magnet, you know, attracts, attracts. Like when, when people use the magnet as a metaphor, and but really you want your memory to be a magnet and attract the good things and uh, repel the annoying or distracting thoughts. So that's really cool that by training your memory, it becomes like a magnet both ways. Yeah, absolutely. And that's been really, really important because I'm not talking about memorizing everything under the sun. I'm also talking about focusing on particular things that legitimately improve your life, that move you forward, which you can't have at all. And you also can't afford to constantly be disrupted. So it's about putting information that is important in place and repelling the stuff that distracts you. Mm -hmm. So Gotcha. Tell us a bit about the challenge frustration curve. That's something that you talk about in your book. And um, I, thought, I thought it was like quite intuitive, but at the same time, not many people stopped to think about it and it was very insightful for me. So 
the challenge frustration curve, what it is and how does it apply to learning to meditate or learning how to memorize things? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you for asking about it. So the general premise is that people need to be challenged in order to grow. We, mm -hmm. we don't really progress if we just have easy street. We actually get lazy and our bodies will decay and our muscles will get flabby, et cetera. But at the same time, when we take on challenges, if we get frustrated, we're going to quit. We're going to give up, right? So we have to balance this equation between needing to be challenged and avoiding frustration at all costs. And so it's almost like riding a wave and finding a sweet spot that always has to change. And just accept, I mean, we always say, right? The only constant is change. And really accepting that, but not only accepting it, embracing it, causing it to happen. So for example, in my own memory project, I know that I, I, I got to a certain okayness with Chinese. So I needed to add something a little bit more challenging to spurn on the next thing. I don't necessarily want it to be harder, but I made it harder. So I went and took a class in Chinese where they only spoke Chinese and they only used characters and pinyin was only available upon request, right? And that was pushing myself to the point of frustration. But when I got frustrated, I would just simply ask, could you write the pinyin, please? You know, that sort of thing. So that's a, a concrete example of it. And my Chinese just flourished as a result because I was willing to take on the additional challenge. And in the final exam, I only got one mistake. Uh, oh, wow. So, yeah, it was like 99.9%. .9%. It was the weirdest exam I ever took. But nonetheless, <laughs> it was so much fun and I'm really glad of it. And likewise with meditation, you know, another challenge in meditation would be adding, you know, another big section of Sanskrit, but this time memorizing it backwards. Or something mm. like that, right? Like that's just, but if it gets frustrating, then know when to scale back and, and make it so that it's just challenging again. You don't, you don't want to, you know, cause yourself to do anything that makes you quit. That's not, that's not a good strategy at all. Okay. That's really cool. So uh, challenging, but not to the point that you're getting frustrated and you don't want to do it anymore. Um, yeah. And Okay, so that's that's a very powerful technique. And so it's basically that curve is individual to everybody, right? Depending on your skill set, depending on where you are in life, you, you'll have a different challenge frustration curve, correct? Yeah, it, it's one of these things you mentioned. It's a, kind of a, a complex, ambitious book. And one of the ideas that's wrapped up in here is the idea of existing competence. So you want to identify your actual ability in order to set goals that you actually can achieve because so many people set goals they're never going to achieve they actually might achieve them but only if they are willing to look at what skill they have right now and then set a goal they actually can achieve because it's achievable mm -hmm. in the realm of their existing competence so for example you might i don't know want to um, learn to fly a plane but yeah. you actually don't know anything about math so are you going to start you know, learning how to fly planes, or are you going to start with a rudimentary math course? You know, I think it's more likely that you could figure out where you are with math, take an initial course that get, I'm, I'm just throwing this example out there, but you know, that you can get some rudimentary math that would lead you to that path, be willing to do it based on your existing competence and, and go from there. And then you're much more likely to actually become the pilot that you envision. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. For example, when I went to do, I think my, <laughs> my brother got me uh, helicopter like uh, trial class you know like an introductory class for my brother or it was the other way around maybe i got it for his birthday i don't remember but um we went to do it and one of the first things they were asking like get yeah, physics you know do you understand how how rotation works and you know gyroscopes and uh, whatever else and uh, yeah so you gotta you gotta be prepared for that yeah absolutely agree okay gotcha um what else from your book that we haven't covered off that you'd like to share with our audience here today? By the way, we haven't mentioned the name of the book. It's called The Victorious Mind. <laughs> I forgot to say the name. Yeah, The Victorious Mind. The Victorious Mind, How to Master Memory, Meditation, and Mental Well-Being. I guess the other thing that I would just say that I think is really important, if, it, if it's useful and helpful for people, is that it's not... My, my biggest feeling is that we have a paradox. And the paradox is, is that one teacher is never enough, but you have to spend enough time with one teacher in order to even begin to understand what's going on there. Mm -hmm. So 
I really would recommend to people that if you're going to go into something, stick with that theme for some time and read a couple of books. So it's not like I read one Gary Weber book. I read every book that I could get. I watched all his YouTube videos. I really sunk into that guy before that I went and started, for example, some Zen Buddhism, right? Because Zen Buddhism is constantly interesting me, you know, because there's all these koans and mental puzzles and I like all this stuff, right? But it's like, no, 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 no. We're not finished with the Gary Weber program, right? And then there's another guy, James Swartz. And I just sort of did eventually read all that guy's books, but it's sort of like after. And then we spend some time with the James Swartz stuff and then maybe go back and revisit Eckhart Tolle, but plan to spend some time, not just dipping in and out and so forth. So it's, it's a paradox. Never one teacher, but always enough time with each individual one. Okay. That's very and if you need a rule of thumb, make it 90 days. Because we know from neurochemistry that habit formation tends to require at least 90 days. People say habits need 23 days and et cetera, et cetera. But I think the better number that Richard Weissman shows quite elegantly with his research in a book called 59 Seconds is much more likely and makes a lot more sense when you look at the neurochemistry of of understanding, of knowledge, and habit formation. Yeah, that's a good point. I saw a, a meme recently on uh, what somebody coming back to work after this coronavirus uh, lockdowns, are they down? And uh, they're hiring person, oh, somebody applying for a job, and the hiring manager asking them on, on an interview, like, so what have you learned in the three, <laughs> they, the, the memes at 300 days of coronavirus lockdown, hopefully it won't be that long. But it, basically, what did you learn in the, time of the coronavirus lockdown and the person well in the meme was very like lost for answers like because they were probably playing computer games all the time or you know just sitting back on the couch watching movies um i think it's a it's an important time for self-development and growth and um learning something and then demonstrating that at your job existing job or new job or at, at interviews is going to be very advantageous what would you say um is like how what kind of advice would you give to people on how to spend their time now during these lockdowns to maximize their return on investment so that when they come out of it they come out of it better people i would suggest doing something that is a combination of an assessment of your life your status quo where things are and a vision statement that helps you think of where you want to be and then think about your existing competence to actually achieve that and do some planning. You don't have to follow the plan. Uh, Joe Polish, he's an interesting entrepreneur. He says planning is often more important than the plan itself. But spend some time planning the progress towards where you would like to be 20 years from now, 20 months from now, 20 weeks from now, et cetera. And just think about what that would look like. So if it was to fly a helicopter, you know, what is the most likely path given what you can find out about the tests and then map it out and figure it out. And, you know, that's maybe not the best metaphor, but I do this often with my own life, the things that I would like to see. Mm. And then I start to chunk it out or chunk it down, better said, into actually achievable units. And then I always stress test, mm. do I really want this? Mm. And I ask like five reasons why, mm. why do I really want this? And try to push it. Because if you can't get five reasons why, maybe you don't really want it. Mm. And really work at finding out what you really want. And uh, keep in mind that for me, it was very simple. I just wanted to stop suffering mm. you know, from, from pain. And now when I think of my vision, I just ask it. You know, I, I, I just ask simple questions like, why do, do I really want that? Is that actually achievable? And am I the kind of person who's ever likely to achieve it? This has helped me so much just because getting peace with the kind of person that I am, the kind of limitations that I have, and then I get much, much better results because I've sort of absorbed them into the planning and I'm, I'm just much more content. So that's what I would, I would strongly recommend for people. And uh, this is talked about in The Victorious Mind, and I got all kinds of free YouTube videos and stuff that talk about vision statements and whatnot uh, to okay. help clarify that. Okay, gotcha. All right, that's that's very very um, powerful advice on how to vision. And uh, for instance, I do my visions for the coming week every Sunday. Well, now I've gotten into the habit of doing it. Um, and I was doing mine. So today we're recording this on a Monday. 
uh, for so yesterday I did mine for the coming week and yeah I really sit down and I write down the top three things that I want to accomplish in the coming week and uh, usually it's not that hard to come up the with the things but if you can only if you limit yourself to only three you still have to make a choice you know like do I want to record this uh, uh, video or these uh, these videos or do I want to you know like uh, hire or apply like, look at seven new applications of marketing managers or contact seven people or whatever else uh, and then I still for each one I come up with at least three reasons like you said five which is even better I come up with at least three reasons why I want to do it why does it excite me why why is it important is it important um, you know from a point of view of uh, connecting with other people from contributing to the world from growing myself from uh, being certain that the business is going to be able to run forward continue growing so I come up with three different reasons why it's important to me and that's very helpful. That really pushes me to get these things done. So, uh, your your answer is expanding that to more of a like a longer term perspective. Figure out what you want and why you want it. So, absolutely agree. Um, Anthony, on that note, we've uh, slowly coming to a wrap of the podcast. Uh, it's been a huge pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the second time. Where is the best places? Uh, where are the best places for people to find you if they'd like to continue their uh, memory journey from uh, following this episode? Well, everything takes place or everything is consolidated, so to speak, at magneticmarymethod.com. And yeah, I always appreciate people saying hello. And yeah, last time I was on, a lot of your audience came by and, and let me know that they'd heard that episode. So I really appreciate it very much. And that's where you can find me. And I, I've heard, I haven't tested this myself, but apparently if your memory is a bit shot and magnetic memory method is too long, I think you could just put Anthony in memory. And I think I come up. Okay. <laughs> it's, worth a, it's worth a test anyway. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Anthony. Looking forward to catching up in person in uh, Australia again. Yeah, absolutely. And hopefully we uh, will be able to, you know, shake hands by that time. As well. <laughs> For sure. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you.